This was actually a really difficult video to write because what queer fandom is means so many things and is so different for every individual. We don't choose which characters we end up having emotional connections with or end up awakening our queerness. For so long we were limited as subtext as the other so there is a long rich and often necessary legacy and history of looking to straight but othered characters and seeing the queerness, seeing the queer possibilities in them that were not allowed to be, either because of censorship or because of inept writers who continue to queer bait. Now in 2020, we have gotten in the past five to 10 years, some of the most groundbreaking LBGTQ representation. And according to GLAAD, the representation we see in films and television keeps breaking new milestones. What does that mean for queer fandom today? Where we no longer need to rely on just subtext, where characters even in children's television cartoons can be overtly queer. And we're allowed to talk about queerness without it being a special moment. It's just part of the dialogue. You're all kinds of awesome, but you should know something. <laughs> you like me as a friend? Yes! because I'm gay. In looking at queer fandom today, especially in the post-Klexa world, I think it's important to examine the milestones we have achieved because they are important and what it means now that queerness is somewhat normalized in the media. But at the same time, there are still so many who are underrepresented in our communities and within the margins of queerness. Who is being left behind? Who is being elevated? And now that we have so much representation with queer writers being behind the scenes telling these stories, how do we discuss what is good representation that accepts the fact that what it means to be queer is not a monolithic experience and that it should at times be allowed to be as messy as heterosexual relationships and heterosexual storylines. Well, well, we're gonna get into it. Just me and good old Dorothy Parker. Lego. The queer baiting era. Growing up in the internet proper in the 2010s, queer baiting had evolved into a very complicated issue, especially in a lot of the major fandoms, especially Super Hulok. If you don't know what that is, you're so lucky. This was an era I remember clearly because it was my childhood that had a bunch of really big men love men couples that were really popular in fandom. That was your Wincest, your John Locke, your Martha, your Steric, your Dean and Castile, all the classics. This is an era that is hard for me to speak about dispassionately. For the sake of the nuance that I like to bring, I want to clarify one thing. I don't have any inherent bias against these ships. I get the appeal, I get why people are into them, and if you ship any of these relationships, blessed be. I just want to make sure that we are on that same page before we get to the critical lens because you can ship something and really enjoy it while being critical of the issues that are present in it. At least, I hope so. What I struggle with a lot when it comes to this topic is wanting to have empathy to those who see something important in these ships, who see them as true potential representation for them and who often feel as if writers, creators, etc. are marketing to them in a disingenuous way. No one should be treated as crazy for shipping two men together. Gay relationships in shows should not be inherently 
seen as crack shipping just because it's queer. That is dismissive and reductive and gross. That is not okay. That being said, somehow advocating for these ships also led to a hotbed of sexism and racism within sections of these fandoms. Not from everyone, but it was a significant part of a lot of people's experiences within dealing with these ships. The fact that in cases these two dudes did not end up together would be placed on the heads of their female love interest. And God help you if that female love interest was also a woman of color, especially a black woman. What is worse is that in order to give the fans what they wanted, but still no homo everything, it would lead to bizarre decisions like the fact that in season five of Merlin, Arthur and Gwen don't share a single kiss in the final season of that show, even though they are married. Not one kiss. And every season that they had been in a relationship, they had had at least one big kiss. It was bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. And I know we could talk about a lot of men loving men relationships here, but I'm gonna pick Steric because I have experiences in the Teen Wolf fandom. Teen Wolf was a very interesting experience. I got into the show when it was in the middle of its second season because everyone was like, surprise, it's actually really good. I watched it religiously until they killed Allison. I will never forgive them. I will never forget them. I know they brought her back for one episode. But I choose never to forgive. Steric was a ship that I saw highlighted all over the tag. So I was like, okay, okay, here we go. We're gonna have some hot, you know, a hot boy on boy werewolf action. It's gonna be interesting. And initially my opinions on Teen Wolf were very pro steric pro styles, and I was a little bit mm, about Scott and Allison. That is the documented fact of my Tumblr since I have seen people go through my Tumblr to check these issues every time I bring up how my opinions have changed. Then as I began to enter the fandom properly, as you know, I was getting into the second season, I began to notice a few things. The complete erasure of Scott as a Mexican heroic lead and why that mattered, something that still continues to happen to this day with people nitpicking his Mexican representation status despite the fact that the reality is Tyler Posey is himself half Mexican, has always said that he considers Scott to be a Mexican and that should in this case be enough because it's a real person. It's not like in Star Wars The Forces of Evil where the voice actor is in Mexican, so there isn't even that layer of it. Scott is Mexican, that is important to have a Chicano, you know, all-American hero type. People also never ever really mentioned the actual gay male character on the show, Danny. I need to have sex, like right now. Someone needs to have sex with me, like today. Like someone needs to sex me right now. All right, I'll do it. Boom! What? Come to my place at nine. Plan to stay the night. I like to cuddle. Who was not only a gay man, but a gay native Hawaiian man. So that Polynesian representation of queerness was not seen as important and not talked about to the point where what was actually happening on the show, I was like, huh, I didn't even know there was a canically gay character on this show. I thought that it was gonna be Styles and Derek, and then it wasn't. These before times are what shape my feelings now as an adult in a lot of ways in terms of queer rep. Because I remember what it was like to see two sides of my identity be in conflict on shows that were trying to represent both sides, my queerness and my brownness, and having to choose sides because of fandom. Even if I liked Steric, the racism against Scott, the way that Steric fans talked about characters of color made me 
ultimately uninterested in supporting those things. The reason why I wanted to start with this particular topic is not because I'm trying to pinpoint the toxicity on just a few kinds of ships. No, because it's an all problem. But sort of examine that this is the place of queer baiting, of wanting certain couples to happen, especially with white men that take precedent over the representation of other marginalized people within the queer community. It is exhausting because while people are spending all of this fandom energy getting those relationships to happen actual queer characters get left behind actual queer representation gets left behind what's even more so is that i don't think we have really moved on collectively past this time. It has not been an easy journey to this place of less dead queer people and less queer baiting. So a lot of us are still on edge about it, making sure that we are getting representation. And a lot of us are also getting more specific about what we want and that's important too we still unfortunately do not have as many male queer relationships as there could be this is obviously a flaw however what does it mean that despite wanting that and despite needing that the relationships that are canonically between gay queer men are not as elevated as the relationships between straight men that people want to be queer and who's shipping those characters it doesn't disvalue it but it is just something to keep in mind when we're talking about what it means to have queer discourse when Kurosami changed the world from 2013 onwards we began to see the transformation of queer characters from not just supporting players but to leads Docubus, Britannia Holstein and many many others as you can probably notice these are mostly women loving women relationships December 19th 2014 the world in my opinion really shifted when Korosami became canon what now back to the dance floor I'm kind of all danced out honestly after everything that's happened the past few months I could use a vacation let's do it Let's go on a vacation, just the two of us. Anywhere you want. Really? Okay. I've always wanted to see what the spirit world's like. There is a lot of discussion about if Korosami is good representation or not. Let me just say my piece here as the one wearing the Korosami t-shirt in this particular video. I do not think The Legend of Korra is a consistently good show. It has nothing to do with me wanting it to be Avatar The Last Airbender. I have plenty of critiques of that show too. It just doesn't have as strong of a narrative for a number of reasons. If you want me to get more into that, I think I already have, but I could. Now that being said, in book three, Bright claimed that they wanted to start moving towards Korasami. We see them growing closer, them both leaving Mako behind, amen. Of course, at this time, there were not many or any canonically LGBTQ animated couples for children. So when a lot of us were watching Korasami happen, we never thought it was a possibility because at that point, it couldn't be. Most of the time it was subtext, like Bubbleine. And the show had been taken off of television at this point and put on Nick.com. And Bragg did, in my opinion, the most they could. As a queer person, as a bisexual woman, the ending was clear. And I was gobsmacked. I could not believe that it had happened. It meant something to me and to many others because now we could say that there were canonically bisexual characters on a Nickelodeon television show for children that ended up together. They may not have kissed, but that moment was more than 
a kiss. It was a shift in the paradigm. Having the spinoff to one of the greatest shows of our generation end up with two bisexual women of color as the end game was a groundbreaking moment, despite the sort of subtextual messy way that we got to that place, which we will get into at a later time. This happened a year before Klexa became a thing and took place three months after the finale of Lost Girl, which ended up with Bo and Lauren making out in a very odd position on top of a car. A human, Lauren Lewis, want to spend the rest of my life with you. Succubus, Bo Dennis. For me, this period was the era where I felt the change begin to happen as a bisexual woman. That we could be in this place where queer relationships could just be the story, be the text. The heroes, we got things like Carmilla, Orphan Black, the canonical queerness of Bubbleine, an Adventure Time. Everything going on with She-Ra, Steven Universe, Craig in the Creek, you know, all of that is important. What is even more impressive is the fact that now, more than ever, we have LGBTQ people behind the scenes working on these stories. Noelle Stevenson and Rebecca Sugar are two non-binary queer people working on two of the greatest shows of all time. Despite Ryan Murphy, himself a gay man, being on the tin of Pose, it is a work of Janet Mock and other black queer trans writers. This shift is especially important because we get writers who understand how to explore queerness without exploiting it without always needing to center it in awkward ways that give us the fullness of these lives, not just the talking points that, that non-queer people want to see. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Pose is trailblazing, but there is still colorism with the way that Candy was treated before and after she died, leaving Electra, who is a queen, as the sole dark-skinned black female representation on the show. That's still a problem. Trans men are still largely absent on the show and in media in general, despite having a place in ballroom culture and just trans culture in general. And that is because of the people getting to tell these stories. Yet, even in this space, we still have a lot of erasure. And it's important to bring that up, not to pin one against the other, but to discuss why certain people and certain peoples within the queer community are much easier to commodify than others. It isn't a shame about our identities. Our identities are still valid because we are people. But when companies want to treat us like a brand, it's important to think about who is getting elevated, not only by television, but by the fandom, the consumers of this media. Who gets left behind? Once upon a time was the bane of my existence for a really long time. It was a show that I felt coasted on the goodwill of its LGBTQ fan base and first two seasons for so long and still ended up being one of the most heteronormative shows I had ever experienced in my entire life. The show had promised to give us an LGBTQ relationship for ages. Now, for those who may not know, the biggest ship at the time in that fandom was Swan Queen, which was Emma Swan and Regina Mills, aka the Evil Queen, who is to this day still one of the greatest of all time characters. <laughs> Even though sometimes people would forget that the Evil Queen is Puerto Rican. Now, sadly, this was a relationship that would have obviously happened if one of them was a cishet male because it all lined up in this very domestic way but both characters still ended up really getting put with two in my opinion annoyingly generic white dudes the show was never that bold but you know who was there just waiting to be iconic queer representation
<sighs> Sleeping warrior. Mulan was explicitly bisexual and had sapphic tension with Ruby, with Merida, with Aurora, yet when the time finally came for them to be a canonical woman-love-woman -woman couple on the show, do you know what happened? They made it Ruby and Dorothy, a character that we had literally spent no time with, but of course it was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz because friend of Dorothy is a thing, but it's like, still, come on! And what's frustrating about this thing is that despite the fact that there have been plenty of amazing women of color queer ships, the majority of the ones you see promoted and celebrated in fandom outside of anime are white, are cis, are thin, able body, and femme presenting. I was looking at this image during Pride, and it was an image of Catradora, Korasame, and Supercorp. My issue with this was not with the ship itself, because I get the appeal of it. And let's face it, Katie McGrath has chemistry with women. It's her gift. She's the Irish Piper Parabo. Like, that's what she does. Do you understand what you've done? My issue is that in a post that was celebrating important canonical women loving women couples, you had two canonical interracially coded ones, and then you had Supercorp, which is not only fanon and non canonical. But it's on a show where there's an actual, healthy, lesbian relationship. <laughs> Alex and Kelly's relationship on Supergirl is actually really good. It's been one of my favorite aspects of the show besides Dreamer because Neonal is amazing. I totally appreciate that Kelly is this gentle, caring person who acts with emotional maturity and empathy. They communicate about their problems. They are on the same page about things. They are really remarkable representation. However, there is like negative hype for them in the tags and in the community, especially when you compare it to how hard people went for Maggie and Alex, which is a problem for a lot of reasons. When Maggie and Alex were a couple, Sanvers was their name, people loved them. I saw art for them everywhere. They were super popular. I would see them all the time when I would go to FlameCon. Where is that for Alex and Kelly? Where is that for Anissa and Grace in Black Lightning? Where is that love even for Dreamer, Nia herself? Or around the writing for Nia and Brainy in which you have a trans woman in a relationship with a character who is played by an Indian actor. You know, where's that for Elena and her partner in One Day at a Time? Where's that for Nomanita? Nomi Marks. Will you marry me? Oh, oh my god. Oh my god, I don't believe this. What? I'm gonna need a Kaplan. Will you marry me? When Winona Earp and One Day at a Time were both up for cancellation, the lengths at which people went to protect Winona Earp were astounding. I love that show, so I was super happy about it. And now One Day at a Time airs on Pop TV. Have you seen? people talking about it? Vita has been cancelled despite it having really groundbreaking and important Chicana representation. And if they cancel Pose, that's basically it for black trans folk representation in television. Not to mention there are very few trans men, non-binary folk, and where there are, they are mostly often white. According to GLAAD, the racial diversity of LGBTQ characters saw another significant decrease this year. So in a year that GLAAD calls record-breaking in terms of film, we still see almost non-existent representation for those who live outside 
the white, cis, able-bodied LG world. Although I will say I do take issue with Glad deciding not to count Hustlers and John Wick 3 in their count. What is good queer representation? As I said before, being queer is not a monolithic experience. Even as a bisexual black woman, there are times I'll hear people talk about stuff within the bisexual spectrum and I'll just be like, that sounds a little sus, but okay. There will never be a single character that will ever perfectly encapsulate what your experience is, what your relationship to your identity is. Personally, what do I consider good representation? Well, well written, not perpetuating stereotypes, broadens the spectrum while bringing something new and interesting to the table. And bonus points if written and created by a person within the community. You will note that nothing in there says healthy, authentic, or that I personally enjoy it. Labeling a fictional relationship as toxic has become a really cheap way to say a lot while saying very little. While I do think it is important for fictional relationships to not perpetuate problematic romances, I think at the same time there is this expectation that relationships between queer people have no conflict, especially on shows with a supernatural and fantastic bent, that just seems really unrealistic to me and unproductive from a writing standpoint. One of my favorite couples of all time is Bulma and Vegeta from Dragon Ball. Vegeta started off in Dragon Ball Z as a mass murderer who killed Bulma's then boyfriend and her best friends. Now they are married with two kids and are straight up domestic goals. You know, Vegeta is team dad with Piccolo, who also used to be a warmongerer. So, you know, it's not like it's unprecedented. Heterosexual couples get to be messy and be OTP and couple goals. And I think it is fair to ask for that same standard to be set when it's appropriate for queer couples. Now, that being said, we should absolutely have standards. There are issues with how a lot of people, especially when they're not queer, have written queer couples. One thing that does irritate me is that a lot of couples that I have watched was how often one partner is keeping some sort of secret from their other partner while they have a sexual relationship and that secret isn't like a small thing, it's a super important one. You see this with Bo and Lauren in Lost Girl where the first time they have sex is with some consent issues because Lauren is technically kind of honeypotting her even though Lauren also wanted to sleep with her anyway, uh, but she's working with the Ash in order to keep Bo from doing something that could foil the Ash's plans. And it is a very traumatic experience with Orphan Black Delphine, who is also a blonde scientist, is keeping secrets from Cosima about part of her cloneness in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Slayer. <laughs> Slayer. Willow mind wipes Tara after they have broken up and they get back together and they have a sexual relationship. That's not fully consensual. These are things to be critical on. And while I ultimately love Docubus and think the tensions between them are what made them compelling, it was also just frustrating that at times how Lauren was often framed as the more difficult choice in comparison to her male counterpart, Dyson. And for some of you who might be saying, well, what about Tamsin? I don't like Tamsin. <laughs> Sorry, Valkyrie shippers. You feel free to yell at me in the comments below. While I personally never enjoyed Orange is the New Black's Piper Alex relationship, at the same time, it was interesting. It was at the forefront of the show and it wasn't any messier than any of the other relationships that were going on. It was like 
authentically queer mess. And that is, for some people, good representation. And if the writers are aware that this relationship has toxic elements and they are exploring it, then that's putting this queer relationship on equal footing narratively with countless heterosexual relationships that do the exact same thing. Now, and I know how this can be construed, so I want to make this very clear. It is fine to not ship something because for you it is personally triggering, because you find it to be upsetting, or because you simply don't like it. But when we're talking about what makes good representation, taste is taste. And there are things that I may not have found interesting but were good representation. For example, um, who say when she was dating that girl in Orange is the New Black, I forget her name, I think her name was So-So. They were cute. They weren't something that I necessarily shipped, but I would always retweet them because I was like, hey, an, an interracial couple with no white people between two queer women, like it was beautiful. I appreciated it for what it was. Didn't light any fire in my loins, but that's okay. Good for it doesn't always have to mean that it's perfect. Good representation should be allowed to be more complicated because Life is complicated. We should hold our creators to standards, absolutely, and we should hold them accountable when we think that they are promoting problematic and harmful behaviors without any sort of understanding of what makes it problematic. However, we need to stop acting as though being queer means there is nothing complicated about it. We live complicated lives. We have complicated relationships. As much as we want and deserve to have positive, sweet, saccharine, lovey-dovey rep, we should also be allowed to have messy, problematic representation. I thought it was super bizarre to me when it came to things like Halstein, where they'd be like, Carmilla is an abuser because she's manipulative. Carmilla is a vampire. Vampires are inherently manipulative. In any vampire romance, there is always some element of manipulation. Why would that be any different because they're queer? Wow. So you're a giant black cat, huh? <laughs> anyway, feel free to disagree because I don't, as I said before, I do not think my opinions are the end all be all, but food for thought. Just wanted to put it out there because I know I'm critical, but I try to be critical in a fair way. And as someone who has had relationships stick in her crawl, I get it. I get when you have a, when you see a couple, you're just like, I just don't fuck with this. And that's okay. But when we want to start saying that if you ship this, then you're a bad queer person and our issues are taste-based and not in terms of the actual content, I found myself through bisexual characters in media. I found my bisexuality there, especially when black characters who were bisexual came up. But the reason we ask for numbers, while we ask for diverse representation, is because we need to see all the possibilities of who we can be. It is great that we have Choni on Riverdale, but what does that mean if Tony is underwritten? What's the point of having Kevin on Riverdale if he always has the same storyline every single time? We have Villain Eve on Killing Eve, but the white writer's room has no idea how to address the complexities of Eve's Korean background unless Sandra Oh does it her damn self. When I think of the asexual people that I love in my life, I don't see any of them really represented in the asexual media when it happens. Asexual characters hardly already exist in media. And therefore, without knowing one personally, how do we learn about asexuality and the spectrum? Sadly, that is left up to the media. The media and queerness are linked. That's why these GLAD reports come out. Before I ever met a trans person in my real day-to-day -day life, I was first exposed to transness through media, which considering the era I grew up in was hella problematic and terrifying and dangerous. But that's why we advocate for better representation. Not because we need to have perfect wish fulfillment characters, but to continue the work of humanizing LGBTQ lives 
and our complexities and our intersections. I had the opportunity about a little over a year ago to be part of a documentary called Queering the Script. What was so important about it was getting to discuss what queer fandom has done to help promote representation. And as we go forward as a fandom with so much power, with so much consumer power, it is important to think about where we pour our energy into. Are we really advocating for an intersectional change? Do we use our fandom to communicate and celebrate all the vastness of queer identity or do we get caught pigeonholed into celebrating the norms? We all have to deal with this. I have to deal with it. I have to deal with that all the time. And I don't make this video to specifically call any particular relationships because there are a lot of issues. We do need more gay male relationships being made canon. We need those to be around and celebrated. But we have to be careful that even those of us who are queer are not fetishizing and weaponizing other queer realities. Being queer in fandom is not easy. A lot of the time we are being forced to do work and explain ourselves in a way that is often not fair. We don't have all the answers. A lot of us are just figuring out who we are. I um, brought up my Way Hot mug so that you guys can know that I come in peace. I originally had a completely different conclusion set up for this video, but with everything that's been going on in the One on Earth fandom, I figured my discussion of that was probably the best conclusion that I could come up with for this video. And even though I didn't write it out, I, I felt like it would come off stronger if I just spoke from the heart. And so this is what I have to say about everything that's been going on in the Earthdom right now. I have been a fan of One on Earth pretty much since it came out. I really love the show. I think that it's overall really funny and I think that everyone is coming into this from with the best intent. However, I think that one of the things that gets really difficult when we're talking about queer representation and talking about the flaws that exist within it is that people then act as though the bar is perfection. And I think that that's really unfair and context matters. And it's hard when you are coming in as a person of color, as a fat woman, as a marginalized person within a marginalized community, trying to express the desire for more. And it's treated as if you want something perfect, especially when that's not the case. And I thought a perfect comparison of this was, and I'm sorry to always bring it up, but Shira, because I did defend Shira in its final season because there were some people saying that it was easy to have Catradora happen because it's two women and that scene is easier. And I felt like that statement really ignored a lot of context about the show, that the show is made for children, that it has been historically harder to get same-sex couples on an animated series, and that it is a very big deal to have the titular lead of a show be a lesbian and have one of the core conflicts in that show be between her and her girlfriend. That, regardless of if you like Catradora or not, is very historically important. Add on to that with confirmation from Noelle Stevenson that Catra is someone who you could read as a mixed race woman of color, which, you know, the blacks clocked that. On top of it, what made me more defensive of She-Ra was that overall, if you look at what She-Ra did from the cast, from the voice cast to the crew to the writer's room, you saw a lot of diversity. In She-Ra, you have a lesbian lead. You have a lesbian, you know, mixed race black uh, co-lead. You have a fat or chubby, you can call Glimmer fat or chubby, either one, who is Asian. You have a very, you know, could be read bisexual but or straight, either way very confident in his sexuality, black character in Bo, who is in an interracial relationship with said chubby Asian character. You have a lesbian character which features a fat woman who is loved and cared for and is giving you super wind power and her black girlfriend. You have another relationship featuring women of color. You have multiple characters of color in the main cast. You have a canonically gay black couple that has many children and a happy marriage and they're not stereotypes 
at all. You have another lesbian couple featuring a character that could be read as trans or non-binary, but also just a really good character and another really sweet, lovingly platonic um, lesbian couple, and also could be read as asexual, um, and as an asexual romantic couple. You also have an a relationship between a relationship between a woman who's on the who's coded as being on the spectrum, who is in love with a character who is written as qu chronically ill with disabilities. You have a non-binary character voiced by a gender queer voice actor. You have a background cast that is full of diversity. You have a writers' room that is filled with diversity. Even though Shira doesn't hit every single beat, it is giving you a lot of diversity. It has more hits than it has misses, which is why even though it's not perfect, it is exceptional because it delivers within that show some things that you do not usually get. In comparison with Winona Earp, body diversity, zero. Really substantial women of color characters that get to exist as more than just props for their white cohorts. Zero. We have potential with Valdez, but we don't know yet. We're going to have to see. The interracial relationships on this show that have been well done, zero. Trans characters, zero. Non-binary characters, zero. Diverse writing room, no. Diverse cast, you have one supporting character who is a man of color in Jeremy, and his character is very much underwritten in comparison to everybody else. He is written to be mostly comic relief and buffoonery. You do not have diversity of body type. You do not have diversity on this show. So when you're saying that it can't meet everyone, you have to acknowledge that it's not really meeting that many people. It is not that exceptional, and that's okay. That's okay. I literally just went and I rewatched Lost Girl. I rewatched the episode Vexed, which features the episode with Bo and Lauren. I love Docubus. It is very problematic. It has some very messy sexual politics. I love Catra Dora. It's not a perfect relationship either. But I'm not judging it on being perfect. And I'm not even saying that, that it being problematic invalidates it. I like Way Hot. I have a Way Hot mug. I appreciate it for what it has been. At the same time, we can also acknowledge that the show skews very normative. And that is an issue on a show that is trying to be at the forefront that was promoted and backed and supported by a diverse coalition of queer people. And we cannot pretend that what people are asking for is exceptional. People have been asking for better POC representation in Winona Earp since at least season two. This is not a new complaint. There is no biodiversity. In the first episode of this season, there is a joke about pads being for sisters, not for misters. This is a show that gets a lot of clout in the queer community that is loved. And I know that Emily Andrews is bisexual. I, I just found that out. I did not know that. And that's fine. And like I said this before with someone on my Discord that I would rather watch shows made by messy queer people than straight messy people. So it is what it is. I think that we can discuss Winona Earp and what it doesn't do and still love it. I love Bo, even though she's a mess. I love Lauren, even though it's a mess. I love Catradora, even though it's not perfect. And we also need to understand that queer representation is more than just relationships, okay? Like I love Catra for more than just her ability to facilitate a relationship with Adora. And I think it's super important that we not get caught up in this idea that when people of color, when fat people, when fat femmes, when non-binary people, when trans folk are saying that this show has not really hit the marks that it should at this point, that we don't see it as inherently divisive. It's just part of the discourse. We are queer too. I don't think anything about that criticism invalidates what you can get out of Way Hot and that Way Hot sex scene. It, if it meant something to you, that's amazing. No one can take that away from you. There's nothing wrong with being attached to things that are not perfect. It was a moment between two characters that was done with love, that was done with consent, that was done with compassion, and was, you know, had queer women involved in it on multiple levels. And that is a good thing.
We can also say that we have had beautiful, white, cis, slim women who are able-bodied be in sex scenes for over a decade and we need to have done more by now. Winona Earp is not a cartoon for children. It is a show made for adults. I have seen sexy scenes like this between two women on multiple other programs that are in genre. And while I think that there can be something special about Way Hot because of what it means to the community, we can also say that, hey, this isn't Pose, this isn't Vita, this isn't something that's giving us multiple layers of representation because it's not. And that's okay, but we have to be able to say it. We have to be able to hold ourselves to a standard that's higher than just existing. We have to be beyond just giving beautiful white women who are queer space. There is more to this community than that. There's more to this community than just sex. Nona Earp is a fun show. It's a show that I enjoy. I'm going to keep watching it. But we can also say that some of the jokes feel dated. We can also say that some of the things that they're talking about in terms of queerness do not seem as impactful considering the environment that we are in right now. I mean, the fact that Nicole is a cop is a complicated thing to deal with in 2020. But again, I'm just one person. I think we can have a conversation about this. It doesn't have to be us versus you. But if that is how you see criticism, especially from those who aren't being represented in your show that you want to reach out to, then, you know, if you say Black Lives Matter, but then I watch your show and the first episode has your sole Black female character pretty much sacrificing herself, injuring herself to help save a white woman, and, that's the, and that is the only black female representation that you've given me in like several seasons. After you killed off a black character two, like two seasons ago, like what am I supposed to feel? What am I supposed to think about that? Yeah. I didn't think this video was going to be relevant when I started redo when I started editing it, and then it was. Oh, dear. Sometimes it hurts instead